Section 23 of Folklore and Legends of Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends of Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets. The Little Glass Shoe. A peasant named John Wilde, who lived in Rodenkirchen, found one time a little glass shoe on one of the hills where the little people used to dance. He clapped it instantly in his pocket and ran away with it, keeping his hand as close on his pocket as if he had a dove in it, for he knew he had found a treasure which the underground people must redeem at any price. Others say that John Wilde lay in ambush one night for the underground people, and snatched an opportunity to pull off one of their shoes by stretching himself there with a brandy bottle beside him and acting like one that was dead drunk, for he was a very cunning man, not over-scrupulous in his morals, and had taken in many a one by his craftiness, and on this account his name was in no good repute among his neighbors, who, to say the truth, were willing to have as little to do with him as possible. Many hold, too, that he was acquainted with forbidden acts, and used to carry on an intercourse with the fiends an old woman that raised storms and such like. However, be this as it may, when John had got the shoe, he lost no time in letting the folk that dwell under the ground know that he had it. At midnight, he went to the Nine Hills and cried with all his might, John Wilde of Rodenkirchen has got a beautiful glass shoe. Who will buy it? Who will buy it? for he knew that the little one who had lost the shoe must go barefoot till he got it again, and that is no trifle, for the little people have generally to walk upon very hard and stony ground. John's advertisement was speedily attended to. The little fellow who had lost the shoe made no delay in setting about redeeming it. The first free day he got that he might come out in the daylight, he came as a respectable merchant, knocked at John Wilde's door, and asked if John had not got a glass shoe to sell. For, says he, they are an article now in great demand, and are sought for in every market. John replied that it was true that he had a very pretty little glass shoe, but it was so small that even a dwarf's foot would be squeezed in it, and that a person must be made on purpose to suit it before it could be of use. For all that, it was an extraordinary shoe, a valuable shoe, and a dear shoe, and it was not every merchant that could afford to pay for it. The merchant asked to see it, and when he had examined it, Glass shoes, said he, are not by any means such rare articles, my good friend, as you think here in Roland Kitchen, because you do not happen to go much into the world. However, said he, after humming a little, I'll give you a good price for it, because I happen to have the very fellow of it. He bid the countryman a thousand dollars for it. A thousand dollars are money, my father used to say when he drove fat oxen to market, replied John Wilde in a mocking tone. But it will not leave my hands for that shabby price, and for my own part it may ornament the foot of my daughter's doll. Hark ye, my friend, I have heard a sort of little song sung about the glass shoe, and it's not for a parcel of dirt it will go out of my hands. Tell me now, my good fellow, should you happen to know the knack of it? How in every furrow I make when I'm ploughing I may find a ducat. If not, the shoe is still mine, and you may inquire for glass shoes at those other markets. The merchant made still a great many attempts, and twist and turned in every direction to get the shoe, but when he found the farmer inflexible, he agreed to what John desired, and swore to the performance of it. Cunning John believed him, and gave him up the glass shoe, for he knew right well with whom he had to do. So the business being ended, away went the merchant with his glass shoe. Without a moment's delay, John repaired to his stable, got ready his horses and his plough, and went out to the field. He selected a piece of ground where he would have the shortest turns possible, and began to plough. Hardly had the plough turned up the first sod when up sprang a ducat out of the ground, and it was the same with every fresh furrow he made. There was now no end of his ploughing and John Wilde soon bought eight new horses, and put them into the stable to the eight he already had, and their mangers were never without plenty of oats in them, that he might be able every two hours to yoke two fresh horses, and so be enabled to drive them the faster. 
John was now insatiable in ploughing. Every morning he was out before sunrise, and many a time he ploughed on till after midnight. Summer and winter it was plough, plough with him evermore, except when the ground was frozen as hard as a stone. He always ploughed by himself, and never suffered any one to go out with him, or to come to him when he was at work, for John understood too well the nature of his crop to let people see for what it was he ploughed so constantly. However, it fared far worse with him than with the horses, who ate good oats, and were regularly changed and relieved, for he grew pale and meagre by reason of his continual working and toiling. His wife and children had no longer any comfort for him. He never went to the alehouse or to the club. He withdrew himself from every one, and scarcely ever spoke a single word, but went about silent and wrapped up in his own thoughts. All the day long he toiled for his two cats, and at night he had to count them, and to plan and meditate how he might find out a still swifter kind of plough. His wife and the neighbors lamented over his strange conduct, his dullness and melancholy, and began to think he was grown foolish. Everybody pitied his wife and children, for they imagined the numerous horses that he kept in his stable, and the preposterous mode of agriculture he pursued, but his unnecessary and superfluous ploughing must soon leave him without house or land. Their anticipations, however, were not fulfilled. Truth it is, the poor man never enjoyed a happy or contented hour since he began to plough the ducats up out of the ground. The old saying held good in his case, that he who gives himself up to the pursuit of gold is halfway in the claws of the evil one. Flesh and blood cannot bear perpetual labor, and John Wilde did not long hold out against his running through the furrows day and night. He got through the first spring, but one day in the second he dropped down, at the tail of the plough, like an exhausted November fly. Out of the pure thirst for gold, he was wasted away and dried up to nothing. Whereas he had been a very strong and hearty man the day the shoe of the little underground man fell into his hands. His wife, however, found he had left a great treasure, two great nailed-up chests, full of good new ducats, and his sons purchased large estates for themselves and became lords and noblemen. But what good did all that to poor John Wilde? End of section 23 Recording by Liana Leitch Section 24 of Folklore and Legends, Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Folklore and Legends, Scandinavian, by Charles John Tibbets. Section 24. How Loki Wagered His Head. Loki the son of Lofi, out of mischief, cut off all the hair of Sif. When Thor discovered this, he seized Loki and would have broken every bone in his body, only he swore that he would get the black dwarves to make hair of gold for Sif, which should grow like any other hair. Loki then went to the dwarves that are called the sons of Invalda. They first made the hair, which, as soon as it was put on the head, grew like natural hair. Then they made the ship, Skidbladner, which always had the wind with it wherever it would sail. Lastly, they made the spear, Gugner, which always hit its mark in battle. Then Loki wagered his head against the dwarf Brock, that his brother, Etri, could not forge three such valuable things as these they went to the forge. Etri set the bellows to the fire, and bid his brother, Brock, blow. While he was blowing, there came a fly that settled on his hand and bit him, but he blew without stopping, till the smith took the work out of the fire, and it was a boar, and its bristles were of gold. Etri then put gold into the fire, and bid his brother not stop blowing till he came back. He went away, and the fly came and settled on Brock's neck, and bit him more severely than before. But he blew on till the smith came back, and took out of the fire the gold ring, which is called Dropner. 
then he put iron into the fire and bid brock blow and said that if he stopped blowing all the work would be lost the fly settled between brock's eyes and bit so hard that the blood ran down so that he could not see so when the bellows were down he caught at the fly in all haste and tore off its wings when the smith came he said that all that was in the fire was nearly spoiled then he took out of it the hammer molnir he then gave all the things to his brother brock and bade him go with them to asgard and settle the wager loki produced his articles and odin thor and frey were the judges then loki gave to odin the spear gugner and to thor the hair that sif was to have and to frey skidbladner and told them what virtues these things possessed brock took out his articles and gave to odin the ring and told him that every ninth night there would drop from it eight other rings as valuable as itself to frey he gave the boar and said that it would run through air and water by night and by day better than any horse and that never was there night so dark that the way by which he went would not be light from his hide the hammer he gave to thor and said that it would never fail to hit a troll and that at whatever he threw it it would never miss the mark and that thor could never throw it so far that it would not return to his hand it would also when thor chose become so small that he could put it in his pocket the only fault of the hammer was that its handle was a little too short their judgment was that the hammer was the best of all things before them and that the dwarf had won his wager then loki prayed hard not to lose his head but the dwarf said that it could not be catch me then said loki and when the dwarf sought to catch him he was far away for loki had shoes with which he could run through air and water then the dwarf prayed thor to catch him and he did so the dwarf now proceeded to cut off his head but loki objected that he was to have the head only and not the neck as he would not be quiet the dwarf took a knife and a thong and began to sew his mouth up but the knife was bad so the dwarf wished that he had his brothers all and as soon as he wished it it was there so he sewed loki's lips together end of section twenty four section twenty five of folklore and legends scandinavian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by carolyn lilliard folklore and legends scandinavian by charles john tibbets the adventures of john dietrich there once lived in Rambin an honest, industrious man named James Dietrich. He had several children, all of a good disposition, especially the youngest, whose name was John. John Dietrich was a handsome, smart boy, diligent at school and obedient at home. His great passion was for hearing stories, and whenever he met anyone who was well stored, he never let him go till he had heard them all. When John was about eight years old, he was sent to spend a summer with his uncle, a farmer, in Rodenkirchen. Here John had to keep cows with other boys, and they used to drive them to graze about the nine hills. There was an old cowherd, one Klaus Starkvolt, who used frequently to join the boys, and then they would sit down together and tell stories klaus abounded in these and he became john dietrich's dearest friend in particular he knew a number of stories of the nine hills and the underground people in the old times when the giants disappeared from the country and the little ones came into the hills these tales john swallowed so eagerly that he thought of nothing else 
and was forever talking of golden cups and crowns and glass shoes and pockets full of ducats and gold rings and diamond coronets and snow-white brides and such like old klaus used to often shake his head at him and say john john what are you about the spade and scythe will be your sceptre and crown and your bride will wear a garland of rosemary and a gown of striped drill still john almost longed to get into the nine hills for klaus told him that every one who by luck or cunning should get a cap of the little ones might go down with safety and instead of their making a servant of him he would be their master the person whose cap he got would be his servant and obey all his commands st john's day when the days were longest and the nights shortest was now come old and young kept the holiday had all sorts of plays and told all kinds of stories john could now no longer contain himself but the day after the festival he slipped away to the nine hills and when it grew dark laid himself down on the top of the highest of them where klaus had told him the underground people had their principal dancing place john lay quite still from ten till twelve at night at last it struck twelve immediately there was a ringing and a singing in the hills and then a whispering and a lisping and a whiz and a buzz all about him for the little people were now some whirling round and round in the dance and others sporting and tumbling about in the moonshine and playing a thousand merry pranks and tricks he felt a secret dread come over him at this whispering and buzzing for he could see nothing of them as the caps they wore made them invisible but he lay quite still with his face in the grass and his eyes fast shut snoring a little just as if he were asleep now and then he ventured to open his eyes a little and peep out but not the slightest trace of them could he see though it was bright moonlight it was not long before three of the underground people came jumping up to where he was lying but they took no heed of him and flung their brown caps up into the air and caught them from one another at length one snatched the cap out of the hand of another and flung it away it flew direct and fell upon john's head the moment he felt it he caught hold of it and standing up bid farewell to sleep he flung his cap about for joy and made the little silver bell of it jingle then set it upon his head and oh wonderful that instant he saw countless and merry swarm of the little people the three little men came slyly up to him and thought by their nimbleness to get back the cap but he held his prize fast and they saw clearly that nothing was to be done in this way with him for in size and strength john was a giant in comparison with these little fellows who hardly came up to his knee the owner of the cap now came up very humbly to the finder and begged in as supplicating a tone as if his life depended upon it that he would give him back his cap no said john you sly little rogue you will get the cap no more that's not the sort of thing one gives away for buttered cake i should be in a nice way with you if i had not something of yours but now you have no power over me and must do what i please i will go down with you and see how you live down below and you shall be my servant nay no grumbling you know you must i know that just as well as you do for klaus starkvold told it to me often and often the little man made as if he had not heard or understood one word of all this he began his crying and whining over again and wept and screamed and howled most piteously for his little cap john however cut the matter short by saying have done you are my servant and i intend to make a trip with you so he gave up especially as the others told him there was no remedy john now flung away his old hat and put on the cap 
and set it firm on his head lest it should slip off or fly away for all his power lay in the cap he lost no time in trying its virtues and commanded his new servant to fetch him food and drink the servant ran away like the wind and in a second was there again with bottles of wine and bread and rich fruits so john ate and drank and looked at the sports and dancing of the little ones and it pleased him right well and he behaved himself stoutly and wisely as if he had been a born master when the cock had now crowed for the third time and the little larks had made their first twirl in the sky and the infant light appeared in solitary white streaks in the east then it went hush 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 through the bushes and flowers and stalks and the hills rent again and opened up and the little men went down john gave close attention to everything and found that it was exactly as he had been told and behold on the top of the hill where they had just been dancing and where all was full of grass and flowers as people see it by day there rose of a sudden when the retreat was sounded a bright glass point whoever wanted to go in stepped upon this it opened and he glided gently in the grass closing again after him and when they had all entered it vanished and there was no further trace of it to be seen those who descended through the glass point sank quite gently into a wide silver tun which held them all and could have easily harbored a thousand such little people john and his man went down into such a one along with several others all of whom screamed out and prayed him not to tread on them for if his weight came on them they were dead men he was however careful and acted in a very friendly way towards them several tons of this kind went up and down after each other until all were in they hung by long silver chains which were drawn and hung without in his descent john was amazed at the brilliancy of the walls between which the ton glided down they were all as it were beset with pearls and diamonds glittering and sparkling brightly and below him he heard the most beautiful music tinkling at a distance so that he did not know what was become of him and from excess of pleasure he fell fast asleep he slept a long time and when he awoke he found himself in the most beautiful bed that could be such as he had never seen the like of in his father's house and it was in the prettiest chamber in the world and his servant was beside him with a fan to keep away the flies and gnats he had hardly opened his eyes when his little servant brought him a basin and towel and held him the nicest new clothes of brown silk to put on most beautifully made with these there was a pair of new black shoes with red ribbons such as john had never beheld in rambin or in rodenkirchen either there were also there several pairs of beautiful shining glass shoes such as are only used on great occasions john was as we may well suppose delighted to have such clothes to wear and he put them upon him joyfully his servant then flew like lightning and returned with a breakfast of wine and milk and beautiful white bread and fruits and such other things as boys are fond of he now perceived every moment more and more that klaus starkvolt the old cowherd knew what he was talking about for the splendor and magnificence he saw here surpassed anything he had ever dreamt of his servant too was the most obedient one possible a nod or a sign was enough for him for he was as wise as a bee as all these little people are by nature john's bedchamber was all covered with emeralds and other precious stones and in the ceiling was a diamond as big as a nine-pin bowl that gave light to the whole chamber in this place they have neither sun nor moon nor stars to give them light 
neither do they use lamps or candlesticks of any kind but they live in the midst of precious stones and have the purest of gold and silver in abundance and the skill to make it light both by day and night though indeed properly speaking as there is no sun there there is no distinction between day and night and they reckon only by weeks they set the brightest and clearest precious stones in their dwellings and in the ways and passages leading underground and in the places where they had their large halls and their dances and their feasts where they sparkled so as to make it eternal day when john had finished breakfast his servant opened a little door in the wall where there was a closet with the most beautiful silver and gold cups and dishes and other vessels and baskets filled with ducats and boxes of jewels and precious stones there were also charming pictures and the most delightful books he had seen in the whole course of his life john spent the morning looking at these things and when it was midday a bell rang and his servant said will you dine alone sir or with the large company with the large company to be sure replied john so his servant led him out john however saw nothing but solitary halls lighted up with precious stones and here and there little men and women who appeared to him to glide in and out of the clefts and fissures of the rocks wondering what it was the bells rang for he said to his servant but where is the company scarcely had he spoken when the hall they were in opened out to a great extent and a canopy set with diamonds and precious stones was drawn over it at the same moment he saw an immense throng of nicely dressed little men and women pouring in through several open doors the floor opened in several places and tables covered with the most beautiful ware and the most luscious meats and fruits and wines placed themselves beside each other and the chairs arranged themselves along the tables and then the men and women took their seats the principal persons now came forward and bowed to john and led him to their table where they placed him among their most beautiful maidens a distinction which pleased john well the party too was very merry for the underground people are extremely lively and cheerful and can never stay long quiet then the most charming music sounded over their heads and beautiful birds flying about sang most sweetly and these were not real birds but artificial ones which the little men make so ingeniously that they can fly about and sing like natural ones the servants of both sexes who waited at table and handed about the golden cups and the silver and crystal baskets with fruit were children belonging to this world whom some casualty or other had thrown among the underground people and who having come down without securing any pledge were fallen into the power of the little ones these were differently clad the boys and girls were dressed in short white coats and jackets and wore glass shoes so fine that their step could never be heard with blue caps on their heads and silver bells round their waists john at first pitied them seeing how they were forced to run about and wait on the little people but as they looked cheerful and happy and were handsomely dressed and had such rosy cheeks he said to himself after all they are not so badly off and i was myself much worse when i had to be running after the cows and bullocks to be sure i am now a master here and they are servants but there is no help for it why were they so foolish as to let themselves be taken and not get some pledge beforehand at any rate the time must come when they will be set at liberty and they will certainly not be longer than fifty years here with these thoughts he consoled himself and sported and played away with his little playfellows and ate and drank and made his servant tell him stories for he would know everything exactly they sat at table about two hours the principal person then rang a bell and the tables and chairs all vanished in a whiff 
leaving the company on their feet. The birds now struck up the, a most lively air, and the little people danced their rounds most merrily. When they were done, the joyous sets jumped and leaped, and whirled themselves round and round, as if the world was grown dizzy. The pretty girls who sat next to John caught hold of him and whirled him about, and without making any resistance he danced round and round with them for two good hours. Every afternoon while he remained there he used to dance thus merrily with them, and to the last hour of his life he used to speak of it with the greatest glee. His language was that the joys of heaven and the songs and music of the angels, which the righteous hoped to enjoy there, might be excessively beautiful, but that he could conceive nothing to surpass the music and the dancing under the earth, the beautiful and lively little men, the wonderful birds in the branches, and the tinkling silver bells in their caps. No one, said he, who has not seen and heard it, can form any idea whatever of it. When the music and dancing were over, it might be about four o'clock. The little people then disappeared and went each about his own business or pleasure. After supper they sported and danced in the same way, and at midnight, especially on starlight nights, they slipped out of the hills to dance in the open air. John used then to say his prayers, a duty he never neglected either in the evening or in the morning, and go to sleep. For the first week John was in the glass hill, he only went from his chamber to the great hall and back again. After the first week, however, he began to walk about, making his servant show and explain everything to him. He found that there were in that place the most beautiful walks in which he might ramble about for miles in all directions without ever finding an end to them. So immensely large was the hill in which the little people lived, and yet outwardly it seemed but a little place, with a few bushes and trees growing on it. It was extraordinary that between the meads and fields, which were thick sown with hills and lakes and islands, and ornamented with trees and flowers in great variety, there ran, as it were, small lanes, through which, as through crystal rocks, one was obliged to pass to come to any new place. And the single meads and fields were often a mile long, and the flowers were so brilliant and so fragrant, and the songs of the numerous birds so sweet, that John had never seen anything on earth like it. There was a breeze, and yet one did not feel the wind. It was clear and bright, and yet there was no heat. The waves were dashing, still there was no danger, and the most beautiful little barks and canoes came like white swans when one wanted to cross the water, and went backwards and forwards of themselves. Whence all this came no one knew, nor could John's servant tell anything about it, but one thing John saw plainly, which was that the large carbuncles and diamonds that were set in the roof and walls gave light instead of sun, moon, and stars. These lovely meads and plains were, for the most part, all lonesome. Few of the underground people were to be seen upon them, and those that were just glided across them as if in the greatest hurry. It very rarely happened that any of them danced out there in the open air. Sometimes about three of them did so, or at most half a dozen. John never saw a greater number together. The Meads were never cheerful except when the servants, of whom there might be some hundreds, were let out to walk. This, however, happened but twice a week, for they were mostly kept employed in the great hall and adjoining apartments or at school, for John soon found they had schools there also. He had been there about ten months, when one day he saw something snow-white gliding into a rock and disappearing. What, said he to his servant, are there some of you that wear white, like the servants? He was informed that there were, but they were few in number, and never appeared at the large tables or the dances, 
except once a year on the birthday of the great hill king who dwelt many thousand miles below in the great deep these were the oldest among them some of them many thousand years old who knew all things and could tell of the beginning of the world and were called the wise they lived all alone and only left their chambers to instruct the underground children and the attendants of both sexes for whom there was a great school john was much pleased with this intelligence and he determined to take advantage of it so next morning he made his servant conduct him to the school and was so well pleased with it that he never missed a day going there they were there taught reading writing and accounts to compose and relate histories stories and many elegant kinds of work so that many came out of the hills both men and women very prudent and knowing people in consequence of what they were taught there the biggest and those of best capacity received instruction in natural science and astronomy and in poetry and in riddle making arts highly esteemed among the little people john was very diligent and soon became a most clever painter and drawer he wrought too most ingeniously in gold and silver and stones and in verse in riddle-making he had no fellow john had spent many a happy year here without ever thinking of the upper world or of those he had left behind so pleasantly passed the time and so many agreeable companions had he of all of them there was none of whom he was so fond of as a fair-haired girl named elizabeth crabbe she was from his own village and was the daughter of frederick crabbe the minister of rambin she was but four years old when she was taken away and john had often heard tell of her she was not however stolen by the little people but had come into their power in this manner one day in summer she and other children ran out into the fields in their rambles they went to nine hills where little elizabeth fell asleep and was forgotten by the rest at night when she awoke she found herself under the ground among the little people it was not merely because she was from his own village that john was so fond of elizabeth but she was very beautiful with clear blue eyes and ringlets of fair hair and a most angelic smile john was now eighteen and elizabeth sixteen their childish fondness was now become love and the little people were pleased to see it thinking that by means of her they might get john to renounce his power and become their servant for they were fond of him and would willingly have had him to wait upon them for the love of dominion is their vice they were however mistaken john had learned too much from his servant to be caught in that way john's chief delight was walking about with elizabeth for he now knew every place so well that he could dispense with the attendance of his servant in these rambles he was always gay and lively but his companion was frequently sad and melancholy thinking on the land above where men live and where the sun moon and stars shine now it happened in one of their walks as they talked of their love and it was after midnight they passed under the place where the tops of the glass hills used to open and let the underground people in and out as they went along they heard of a sudden the crowing of several cocks above at this sound which she had not heard for several years elizabeth felt her heart so affected that she could contain herself no longer but throwing her arms around john's neck she bathed his cheek with her tears at length she said dearest john everything down here is very beautiful and the little people are kind and do nothing to injure me but still i have been always uneasy nor ever felt any pleasure till i began to love you and yet that is not pure pleasure for this is not a right way of living such as is fit for human beings 
Every night I dream of my father and mother, and of our churchyard where the people stand so pious at the church door, waiting for my father, and I could weep tears of blood that I cannot go into the church with them and worship God as a human being should. For this is no Christian life we lead down here, but a delusive half-heathen one. And only think, dear John, that we can never marry, as there is no priest to join us. Do then plan some way for us to leave this place, for I cannot tell you how I long to get once more to my father and among pious Christians. John, too, had not been unaffected by the crowing of the cocks, and he felt what he had never felt there before, a longing after the land where the sun shines. Dear Elizabeth, said he, all you say is true, and I now feel it is a sin for Christians to stay here, and it seems to me as if our Lord said to us in that cry of the cocks, Come up, ye Christian children, out of those abodes of illusion and magic. Come to the light of the stars and act as children of the light. I now feel that it was a great sin for me to come down here, but I trust I shall be forgiven on account of my youth, for I was only a boy and knew not what I did. But now I will not stay a day longer. They cannot keep me here. At these last words, Elizabeth turned pale, for she recollected that she was a servant and must serve her fifty years. And what will it avail me, cried she, that I shall continue young, but be but as of twenty years when I go out, for my father and mother will be dead, and all my companions old and gray, and you, dearest John, will be old and gray also, cried she, throwing herself on his bosom. John was thunderstruck at this, for it had never before occurred to him. He, however, comforted her as well as he could, and declared he would never leave the place without her. He spent the whole night in forming various plans. At last he fixed on one, and in the morning he dispatched his servant to summon to his apartment six of the principal of the little people. When they came, John thus mildly addressed them. My friends, you know how I came here, not as a prisoner or servant, but as a lord and master over one of you, and of consequence over all. You have now the ten years I have been with you treated me with respect and attention, and for that I am your debtor. But you are still more my debtors, for I might have given you every sort of vexation and annoyance, and you must have submitted to it. I have, however, not done so, but have behaved as your equal, and have sported and played with you rather than ruled over you. I have now one request to make. There is a girl among your servants whom I love, Elizabeth Crabbe of Rambin, where I was born. Give her to me and let us depart, for I will return to where the sun shines and the plow goes through the land. I ask to take nothing with me but her and the ornaments and furnitures of my chamber. He spoke in a determined tone, and they hesitated and cast their eyes upon the ground. At last the oldest of them replied, Sir, you ask what we cannot grant. It is a fixed law that no servant can leave this place before the appointed time. Were we to break through this law, our whole subterranean empire would fall. Anything else you desire, for we love and respect you, but we cannot give up Elizabeth. You can and you shall give her up, cried John in a rage. Go think of it till tomorrow. Return then at this hour. I will show you whether or not I can triumph over your hypocritical and cunning stratagems. The six retired. Next morning, on their return, John addressed them in the kindest manner, but to no purpose. 
they persisted in their refusal he gave them till the next day threatening them severely in case they proved refractory next day when the six little people appeared before him john looked at them sternly and made no return to their salutations but said to them shortly yes or no they answered with one voice no he then ordered his servant to summon twenty-four more of the principal persons with their wives and children when they came they were in all five hundred men women and children john ordered them forthwith to go and fetch pickaxes spades and bars which they did in a second he now led them out to a rock in one of the fields and ordered them to fall at work at blasting hewing and dragging stones they toiled patiently and made as if it were only sport to them from morning till night their taskmaster made them labor without ceasing standing over them constantly to prevent them resting still their obstinacy was inflexible and at the end of some weeks his pity for them was so great that he was obliged to give over he now thought of a new species of punishment for them he ordered them to appear before him the next morning each provided with a new whip they obeyed and john commanded them to lash one another and he stood looking on while they did it as grim and cruel as an eastern tyrant still the little people cut and slashed themselves and mocked at john and refused to comply with his wishes this he did for three or four days several other courses did he try but all in vain his temper was too gentle to struggle with their obstinacy and he commenced to despair of ever accomplishing his dearest wish he began now to hate the little people of whom he had before been so fond he kept away from their banquets and dances and associated with none but elizabeth and ate and drank quite solitary in his chamber in short he became almost a hermit and sank into moodiness and melancholy while in this temper as he was taking a solitary walk in the evening and to divert his melancholy was flinging the stones that lay in his path against each other he happened to break a tolerably large one and out of it jumped a toad the moment john saw the ugly animal he caught him up in ecstasy and put him in his pocket and ran home crying now i have her i have my elizabeth now you shall get it you little mischievous rascals on getting home he put the toad into a costly silver casket as if it was the greatest treasure to account for john's joy you must know that klaus starwolt had often told him that the underground people could not endure any ill smell and that the sight or even the smell of a toad made them faint and suffer the most dreadful tortures and that by means of one whose odious animals one could compel them to do anything hence there are no bad smells to be found in the whole glass empire and a toad is a thing unheard of there this toad must certainly have been enclosed in the stone from the creation as it were for the sake of john and elizabeth resolved to try the effect of his toad john took the casket under his arm and went out and on the way he met two of the little people in a lonesome place the moment he approached they fell to the ground and whimpered and howled most lamentably as long as he was near them satisfied now of his power he the next morning summoned the fifty principal persons with their wives and children to his apartment when they came he addressed them reminding them once again of his kindness and gentleness toward them and of the good terms on which they had hitherto lived he reproached them with their ingratitude in refusing him the only favor he had ever asked of them but firmly declared that he would not give way to their obstinacy therefore said he for the last time think for a minute and if you then say no 
you shall feel that pain which is to you and your children the most terrible of all pains they did not take long to deliberate but unanimously replied no and they thought to themselves what new scheme has the youth hit on with which he thinks to frighten wise ones like us and they smiled as they said no their smiling enraged john above all and he ran back a few hundred paces to where he had laid the casket with the toad under a bush he was hardly come within a few hundred paces of them when they all fell to the ground as if struck with a thunderbolt and began to howl and whimper and to writhe as if suffering the most excruciating pain they stretched out their hands and cried have mercy have mercy we feel you have a toad and there is no escape for us take the odious beast away and we will do all you require he let them kick a few seconds longer and then took the toad away they then stood up and felt no more pain john let all depart but the six chief persons to whom he said this night between twelve and one elizabeth and i will depart load then for me three wagons with gold and silver and precious stones i might you know take all that is in the hill and you deserve it but i will be merciful further you must put all the furniture of my chamber in two wagons and get ready for me the handsomest travelling carriage that is in the hill with six black horses moreover you must set at liberty all the servants who have been here so long that on earth they would be twenty years old and upwards and you must give them as much silver and gold as will make them rich for life and make a law that no one will be, ta be detained here longer than his twentieth year the six took the oath and went away quite melancholy and john buried his toad deep in the ground the little people labored hard and prepared everything at midnight everything was out of the hill and john and elizabeth got into the silver tun and were drawn up it was then one o'clock and it was midsummer the very time that twelve years before john had gone down into the hill music sounded around them and they saw the glass hill open and the rays of the light of heaven shine on them after so many years and when they got out they saw the first streaks of dawn already in the east crowds of the underground people were around them busied about the wagons john bid them a last farewell waved his brown cap three times in the air and then flung it among them at the same moment he ceased to see them he beheld nothing but a green hill and the well-known bushes and fields and heard the town clock of Rambin strike two. When all was still, save a few larks, who were tuning their morning songs, they all fell on their knees and worshipped God, resolving henceforth to live a pious and Christian life. When the sun rose, John arranged the procession, and they set out for Rambin. Every well-known object that they saw awoke pleasing recollections in the bosom of John and his bride as they passed by Rodenkirchen. John recognized among the people that gazed at and followed them his old friend Klaus Starvolt, the cowherd, and his dog Speed. It was about four in the morning when they entered Rambin, and they halted in the middle of the village, about twenty paces from the house where john was born the whole village poured out to gaze on these asiatic princes for such the old sexton who had in his youth been at constantinople and at moscow said they were there john saw his father and mother and his brother andrew and his sister trine the old minister crabbe stood there too in his black slippers and white nightcap gaping and staring with the rest john discovered himself to his parents and elizabeth to hers and the wedding day was soon fixed 
and such a wedding was never seen before or since in the island of Rügen, for John sent to Strasslund and Griefswald for whole boatloads of wine and sugar and coffee, and whole herds of oxen, sheep and pigs were driven to the feast. The quantity of hearts and rows and hairs that were shot upon the occasion it were vain to attempt to tell, or to count the fish that was caught. There was not a musician in Rügen or in Pomerania that was not engaged, for John was immensely rich, and he wished to display his wealth. John did not neglect his old friend Klaus Starkvolt, the cowherd. He gave him enough to make him comfortable for the rest of his days, and insisted on his coming and staying with them as often and as long as he wished. After his marriage, John made a progress through the country with his wife, and he purchased towns and villages and lands until he became master of nearly half Rügen and a very considerable count in the country. His father, old James Dietrich, was made a nobleman, and his brothers and sisters gentlemen and ladies, for what cannot money do? John and his wife spent their days in doing acts of piety and charity, they built several churches and had the blessing of every one that knew them and died universally lamented it was count john dietrich that built and richly endowed the present church of rambin he built it on the site of his father's house and presented to it several of the cups and plates made by the underground people and his own and elizabeth's glass shoes in memory of what had befallen them in their youth but they were taken away in the time of the great Charles the Twelfth of Sweden, when the Russians came on the island and the Cossacks plundered even the churches and took away everything. End of The Adventures of John Dietrich Recorded by Carolyn Lilliard End of Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets Section 26 of Folklore and Legends Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Troutwine. Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets. How Thorsten Became Rich. When spring came, Thorsten made ready his ship and put twenty-four men on board of her. When they came to Finland, they ran her into a harbor, and every day he went on shore to amuse himself. He came one day to an open part of the wood, where he saw a great rock, and a little way out from it was a horribly ugly dwarf. He was looking over his head, with his mouth wide open, and it appeared to Thorsten that it stretched from ear to ear, and that the lower jaw came down to his knees. Thorsten asked him why he acted so foolishly. Do not be surprised, my good lad, answered the dwarf. Do you not see that great dragon that is flying up there? He has taken my son, and I believe that it is Odin himself who sent the monster to do it. I shall burst and die if I lose my son. Then Thorsten shot at the dragon, and hit him under one of the wings, so that he fell dead to the earth. But Thorsten caught the dwarf's child in the air, and brought him to his father. The dwarf was very glad, more rejoiced than any one can tell and he said i have to reward you for a great service you who are the deliverer of my son now choose your reward in silver or gold take your son said thorsten but i am not used to accept rewards for my services it would not be becoming said the dwarf if i did not reward you i will give you my vest of sheep's wool do not think it is a contemptible gift for you will never be tired when swimming or wounded if you wear it next to your skin thorsten took it and put it on and it fitted him well, though it had appeared too small for the dwarf. The dwarf next took a gold ring out of his purse and gave it to Thorsten, and bade him take good care of it, telling him he would never want money while he had the ring. Next he gave him a black stone and said, If you hide the stone in the palm of your hand, no one will see you. I have not many things to offer you, or that would be of any value to you. I will, however, give you a firestone for your amusement. He took the stone out of his purse, and with it a steel point. The stone was triangular, 
white on one side and red on the other, and the yellow border ran round it. The dwarf said, If you prick the stone with a point in the white side, there will come such a hailstorm that no one will be able to look at it. If you want to stop the shower, you have only to prick the yellow part, and there will come so much sunshine that the hail will melt away. If you prick the red side, there will come out of it such fire with sparks and crackling that no one will be able to look at it. You may also get whatever you will by means of this point in stone, and they will come of themselves back to your hand when you call them. I can give you no more such gifts. Thorsten then thanked the dwarf for his presence, and returned to his men, and it was better for him to have made that voyage than to have stayed at home. End of How Thorsten Became Rich Recording by Kurt Troutwine Section 27 of Folklore and Legends Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Troutwine. Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets. Goodbrand. There was once upon a time a man called Goodbrand. He had a farm which lay far away on a hill and he was therefore known as Goodbrand of the hillside. He and his wife lived so happily together, and were so well matched, that do what the man would, his wife was well pleased, thinking nothing in the world could be better. The farm was their own, and they had a hundred dollars which lay in a box, and in the stall they had two cows. One day the woman said to Goodbrand, I think it would be well to take one of the cows to town and sell it, and so we shall have some money at hand. We are such fine folk that we ought to have a little money ready, as other people have. As for the hundred dollars which lie in the chest, we must not make a hole in them. But I do not see why we should keep more than one cow. We shall, too, gain something, for I shall then only have to look after one cow, instead of having to litter and feed two. This Goodbrand thought was right and reasonable. So he took the cow and set off to town to sell it, when he arrived there he could find no one who would buy the beast. Well, well, said he, I can go home again with the cow. I have a stall and litter for her, and the road home is no longer than the road here. So he began to go homewards again. When he had gone a little distance he met a man who had a horse he wanted to sell. So Goodbrand thought it would be better to have a horse than a cow, and exchanged with him. He went on a bit further, and met a man walking along driving a fat pig before him, and he thought it would be better to have a fat pig than a horse. So he exchanged with the man. He went on a bit further and met a man with a goat. A goat, he thought, was better than a pig, so he exchanged with him. He went on a good bit further till he met a man who had a sheep, and he exchanged with him, for he thought the sheep was always better than a goat. He went on again, and met a man with a goose, so he exchanged the sheep for the goose. Then he went a long, long way, and met a man with a cock. So he gave the goose for the cock, for he thought to himself, It is better to have a cock than a goose. He walked on till late in the day, and then, as he was getting hungry, he sold the cock for twelve shillings, and bought something to eat. For, thought Goodbrand of the hillside, it is better to save one's life than to have a cock. Then he walked on homeward till he came to the house of his nearest neighbor, and there he looked in. "'Well, how did you get on in town?' asked the neighbor. "'Only so-so,' said the man. "'I cannot say if I had good luck or bad luck.' And then he began and told them all that had happened. "'Well,' said the neighbor, "'you will catch it when you get home to your wife. Heaven help you. I would not stand in your shoes.' I think things might have been much worse, said Goodbrand of the hillside. But whether things have gone well or badly, I have such a gentle wife that she never says anything. Do what I will. Ah, said the neighbor, I hear what you say, but I don't believe it. Shall we make a bet, said Goodbrand? I have a hundred dollars lying at home in a chest. Will you lay as much? The neighbor was willing, so the bet was made. They waited till evening, and then set out for Goodbrand's house. The neighbor stood outside the door while Goodbrand went inside to his wife. Good evening, said Goodbrand, when he went inside. 
"'Good evening,' said his wife. "'Heaven be praised, is it you?' "'Yes, it was he.' His wife then asked him how things went at the town. "'Oh, so-so,' said Goodbrand. "'Not much to boast of. When I came to the town I could find no one to buy the cow, so I exchanged it for a horse.' "'Thanks for that,' said the wife. "'We are such fine folk we can ride to church the same as other people. And as we can keep a horse we might as well have one. Go and put the horse up, children.' But, said Goodbrand, I have not got the horse. After I had gone a bit further, I exchanged it for a pig. Well, well, said his wife. That was good. I shall have done the same. Thanks for that. Now I shall have meat in the house to put before folk when they come to see me. What can we do with a horse? People would have only have said that we got too proud to walk to church. Go along, children, and put the pig in the sty. But I have not got the pig either, said Goodbrand. When I had gone on a bit further, I exchanged it for a milk goat. Bless me, said the wife. You do everything well. When I think of it, what could we have done with a pig? Folk would only have said we eat up all we had. Now we have a goat, we shall have milk and cheese. And we shall have a goat too. Run, children, go put up the goat. But I have not got the goat, said Goodbrand. I went on a bit and exchanged it for a fine sheep. Well, said the wife. You have done just what I should have wished, just as if I had done it myself. What did we want a goat for? I should have had to go over hill and dale after it. Now we have sheep, I shall have wool and clothes in the house, and food as well. Go, children, and put up the sheep. But I have not got the sheep either, said Goodbrand. I went on a while, and I exchanged it for a goose. You shall have thanks for that, said the wife. Many thanks. What would we have done with a sheep? I have no spinning wheel nor distaff, and I should not care to bother about making clothes. We can buy clothes, as we have always done. Now we shall have a roast goose, which I have so often wished for, and I shall be able to stuff my little pillow with the down. Go and bring in the goose, children. But, said Goodbrand, I have not got the goose either. When I had gone on a bit further, I gave it in exchange for a cock. Heaven knows, said the wife, how you thought all this out so well. It is just what I should have done myself. A cock? Why, it is just the same as if you had bought an eight-day clock, for a cock crows at four o'clock every morning, so we shall be able to get up in good time. What will we have done with a goose? I don't know how to cook it, and I can stuff my pillow with moss. Run and fetch the cock in, children. I have not got the cock either. When I had gone on a bit further I got hungry, and so I sold the cock for twelve shillings so that I might live. Thank God you did so, said his wife. Whatever you do, you do it just as I should have wished. What could we have done with a cock? We are our own masters, and can lie in bed in the morning as late as we please. Thank heaven you came back again safe. You do everything so well that we can well spare the cock, the goose, the pig, and the cow. Then Goodbrand opened the door. Have I won the hundred dollars? said he, and the neighbor was obliged to own that he had. End of Good Brand. Recording by Kurt Troutwine. Section twenty eight of Folklore and Legends Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets The Dwarf Sword Turfing Suaforlami, the second in descent from Odin, was king over Galdarik, Russia. One day he rode a-hunting, and sought long after a heart, but could not find one the whole day. When the sun was setting, he found himself plunged so deep in the forest that he knew not where he was on his right hand he saw a hill and before it he saw two dwarfs he drew his sword against them and cut off their retreat by getting between them and the rock they offered him ransom for their lives and he asked them their names and they said that one of them was called dyron and the other dwaylin then he knew that they were the most ingenious and the most expert of all the dwarfs and he therefore demanded that they should make for him a sword the best that they could form 
its hilt was to be of gold and its belt of the same metal he moreover commanded that the sword should never miss a blow should never rust that it should cut through iron and stone as through a garment and that it should always be victorious in war and in single combat on these conditions he granted the dwarfs their lives at the time appointed he came and the dwarfs appearing they gave him the sword when duelin stood at the door he said this sword shall be the bane of a man every time it is drawn and with it shall be perpetrated three of the greatest atrocities and it will also prove thy bane Suafo Lami, when he heard that struck at the dwarf so that the blade of the sword penetrated the solid rock thus Suafo Lami became possessed of this sword and he called it turfing he bore it in war and in single combat and with it he slew the giant Tiasse, whose daughter fridur he took Suafo Lami was soon after slain by the berserker andgrim who then became master of the sword when the twelve sons of andgrim were to fight with hjalmar and oddur for ingaborg the beautiful daughter of king ingus angantir bore the dangerous turfing but all the brethren were slain in the combat and were buried with their arms angantir left an only daughter hervor who when she grew up dressed herself in man's attire and took the name of hervada and joined a party of vikinger or pirates knowing that turfing lay buried with her father she determined to awaken the dead and obtain the charmed blade she landed alone in the evening on the island of sams where her father and uncles lay in their sepulchral mounds and ascending by night to their tombs that were enveloped in flame she by the force of entreaty obtained from the reluctant angantir the formidable turfing hervor proceeded to the court of king gudmund and there one day as she was playing at tables with the king one of the servants chanced to take up and draw turfing which shone like a sunbeam but turfing was never to see the light but for the bane of man and hervor by a sudden impulse sprang from her seat snatched the sword and struck off the head of the unfortunate man after this she returned to the house of her grandfather jarl bjartmar where she resumed her female attire and was married to haufud the son of king gudmund she bore him two sons angantir and heidrecker the former of a mild and gentle disposition the latter violent and fierce haufud would not permit heidrecker to remain at his court and as he was departing his mother among other gifts presented him with turfing his brother accompanied him out of the castle before they parted heidrecker drew out his sword to look at and admire it but scarcely did the rays of light fall on the magic blade when the berserker rage came on its owner and he slew his gentle brother after this he joined a body of vikinger and became so distinguished that king harold for the aid he lent him gave him his daughter helga in marriage but it was the destiny of turfing to commit crime and harold fell by the sword of his son-in-law heidrecker was afterwards in russia and the son of the king was his foster-son one day as they were out hunting heidrecker and his foster-son happened to be separated from the rest of the party when a wild boar appeared before them heidrecker ran at him with his spear but the beast caught it in his mouth and broke it across then he alighted and drew turfing and killed the boar on looking round him he saw no one but his foster son and turfing could only be appeased with warm human blood so heidrecker slew the poor youth in the end heidrecker was murdered in his bed by his scottish slaves who carried off turfing his son angantir who succeeded him discovered the thieves and put them to death and recovered the magic blade he made great slaughter in battle against the huns but among the slain was discovered his own brother landur so ends the history of the dwarf sword turfing end of section twenty eight 
End of Folklore and Legend Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets.